Thanks for joining us. This is North Coast Perspectives. I'm James Falk. It's apparent this week in Humboldt County that two COVID hotspots have emerged, both producing new cases as well as the potential for further spread, even as their leaders do their absolute best to curtail that growth. The Hoopa Valley Indian Reservation is one of those hot spots, according to figures released this week from the Kama Medical Center, with a total of 46 cases, 17 of which are now active. They also report 29 recoveries among their patients. Like many Native American communities throughout the country, these figures illustrate how Hoopa has been hit disproportionately hard by the virus. They join many communities of color who've too often found themselves on the front lines in the fight against COVID. Even as we collectively acknowledge a cultural moment in which the general population is recognizing the presence of racism in our communities and the need to do something about it. The other danger zone for Humboldt County these past few weeks has been Humboldt State University. Officials there were incensed last week when Humboldt County health officials decided to oppose the university's plans for on-site instruction. The university has since revised its academic calendar to address these issues, with on-site instruction limited to a shortened period between September and November. HSU is not alone in this struggle. Universities across the country are battling these same issues, with many deciding at the last minute to conduct their classes online after planning otherwise for months. Yet even as the fate of this upcoming semester remains up in the air for many students, the cost of this increasingly dangerous education has remained the same or even worse, gone up. Given the sad state of our national reaction to COVID-19, none of these issues should be surprising. We now have collective momentum toward recognizing the long-term inequities that have plagued our nation for generations. These failures should crystallize for us the need for the kind of educational and health care reform that would make such disparate outcomes a thing of the past. Joining us today for the interview is Rain Marshall from the Northern California Indian Development Council, who will describe a new partnership her organization has developed with the ACLU to help Native students of Humboldt and Del Norte counties. First, what is the Northern California Indian Development Council and how does it work? All right, well, thanks, James, for having me. The Northern California Indian Development Council is a nonprofit organization that's been around for 44 years. It was established in 1976, and it was designed to research, develop, and administer social and economic development programs designed to meet the needs of the Native American communities and to provide support and technical assistance for the development of such programs and the conservation and preservation of historic and archeological sites and resources. In indigenous societies, there's a philosophy about looking seven generations ahead and making plans for the well-being of your ancestors and your relatives. And so NCIDC works to develop culturally uh, appropriate communication and services that are needed by the Native American community to achieve self-determination in economic, social services, cultural, educational, and employment. Our youth are sacred and they deserve to be proud of their culture, heritage, traditions, languages, and ancestors. So we strive to help our people succeed in all aspects of their life, spiritually, physically, emotionally, and mentally. NCIDC offers a lot of services to the local Native American communities in Humboldt and Del Norte counties and Siskiyou. And some of those opportunities are job and career counseling, referrals, work experience, on the job training and classroom training. Right now, a lot of those services are being provided online because we're closed. So we have a curbside assistance and online forms to get access to some of those services also for people experiencing emergency needs. So for example, food cards and gas cards are available, housing rent assistance. And again, those forms are online. And tobacco prevention is a big goal at NCIDC for our youth and suicide prevention and substance abuse prevention for the youth. And we have a Native American gift shop that features local Native American artists. Excellent. Now, this new agreement that you're talking about forming with the ACLU is to help foster education reform. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. The position of the project is called the Indigenous Education Advocacy Project, and it was 10 years in the making. And 
It has to do with overcoming racial discrimination in this region. Um, because we have such a bloody history here of massacres and genocide against the indigenous people, we have the leftover remnants of violence and systemic racism in our institutions. And so the ACLU became involved about 10 years ago and three school districts in those two counties had to be sued because there was egregious racial discrimination happening at the school on behalf of staff, teachers, and student to student. Um, they also had to file a complaint with the US Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. So since that time, and because of that, because of that climate in the school that was not embracing Native American culture, um, the ACLU got involved and the NCIDC became a coalition partner with the ACLU. And now this position is trying to alleviate some of those disparities. For Can example, we, harsh discipline um, and educational equity. Yeah, talking about educational e equity, I mean, we're in an age right now of COVID where distance learning has become such a an important part of how kids can learn when they can't actually go into the school grounds or um, it, it represents a risk to their health to go to those school grounds. Um, can you talk a little bit about the inequities that um, say na Native students face in that regard right now? Okay, well, many students are uh, on IEPs, individual education plans, or have accommodations uh, from 504 under three federal laws, the in Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the Rehabilitation Act. And so since March, March through June, a lot of those students didn't receive those services such as speech therapy or occupational therapy or specific tutoring for reading help. And so there's been regressions. Now with this school semester starting, a lot of the students are behind. And the digital divide aggravates the situation. So you have these rural communities like Lolita, uh, Hoopa, Wichapec, um, Pequon, these places where children go to public schools, but they live either on the Indian reservation or Rancheria, and they don't have access to high speed internet. And they also don't have enough technology, technological devices at home, like laptops, desktop computers, tablets. And so that's part of the advocacy is to help raise awareness and to find the resources so that every student in every household has high speed internet and has technological devices and it's it's made even worse if a situation when the student has needs um, for special education and some of the schools are being very progressive in how they deliver those services but some schools are still scrambling and so we have the situation where students that have disabilities, learning disabilities, emotional disabilities, intellectual disabilities, are not receiving the services they need during this, this time of online learning. Mm. And that's not fair and that's not equitable. And a lot of it has to do with income. And so some families, they just can't afford a device for every child and some schools don't have enough to go out to every child. And so you have a disparity um, of access and delivery of education. And it's supposed to be free and appropriate and public. And so it's not free if parents can't afford internet at home. Yeah. If an entire group of people suffers from a lack of educational opportunities, like you've outlined, what are the likely long-term outcomes uh, that we can you know, predict in their communities? Well, I think any advocacy with a child is going to create a long-term positive impact on their life that can create the, a better likelihood for their success and also to help make sure that they avoid going down the wrong path. And I think that's where a lot of our indigenous students, the schools are failing because they have intergenerational trauma or historical trauma from surviving these massacres. I mean, there's whole communities of tribes that should be here that aren't here. And so I think that there really needs to be a focus on teachers becoming trained in trauma-informed practices and to make the school curriculum more reflective of indigenous students' identity so that 
they're visible. Native American students' culture is in is visible and not erased because it reinforces self-esteem. When you learn from your textbook and your teacher that there's only a few natives left on this earth or you learn some misinformation or glorifying Columbus or other oppressive um, colonizers, you create a climate where Native American students don't feel accepted and they don't feel their identity is reinforced. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now, but I really appreciate you coming on and sharing with us about this uh, important topic, and I'd like to invite you back at some point in the future. Okay, if anyone wants to contact me, it's rain at ncidc.org. Awesome, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Have a good weekend. At a forum held Tuesday to address the planned removal of four dams on the ailing Klamath River, Congressman Jared Huffman and others took aim at the Pacific Corps Company for waffling on that decade-old agreement. The forum, aired by Keat TV, was held at HSU's Aquatic Center. All four dams, owned by Pacific Corps and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, have been the source of considerable controversy over the past 20 years. Native American communities up and down the river, as well as downstream fisheries and environmental organizations, have long maintained that the dams have led to algae blooms, fish die-offs, low flows, and rising river temperatures. In 2010, Pacific Corps reached an agreement with other stakeholders to begin removal of the dams by 2020. But a recent decision by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which governs hydroelectric projects across the country, threw a wrench in the gears. Pacific Corps says that in order to move forward with removal, it needs to address the issue of liability. The FERC decision mandates that Pacific Corps be in charge of removal rather than a legal entity created for just that purpose. Joseph James, Yurok tribal chairman, said the river has long been the tribe's sacred responsibility. This difficult conversation about reconciliation past injustice is occurring all over the country by different people of color and it's long overdue. We too have suffered from attempted genocide, sometimes directly through violence and sometimes through slow strangulations of very things that make us who we are today, the Klamath River. In 2020, that was the year the Klamath Dam was supposed to be coming down, right now. Not years from now, but today. Pacific Corps' license expired 14 years ago. Now they say more delay is necessary. Meanwhile, the river is dying. It needs to be healed. We work with Pacific Corps to lessen their corporate risk. Th these issues now threaten the current agreement according to Pacific Corps. Nobody talks about the risk to the Yurok tribe. Nobody talks about the risk to, to the tribes. Nobody talks about the risk, about a risk package, our liability reduction for tribal culture or the Klamath River itself. The Yurok tribe since the beginning of time has taken on the risk and the liability to protect our Klamath River, not just for the benefit of the Yurok tribe, but the benefit of everybody. State Senator Mike McGuire praised Pacific Corps' willingness to remain at the negotiating table, even as he promised that local, state, and federal governments will go to the mat if necessary. The dams have outlived their usefulness and are an economic and environmental liability. The science the science is clear. We will hear from several outstanding panelists who will provide us with more details on the impacts, the impacts that these antiquated structures have had and why dam removal is our best option. Finally, there has been an agreement on the table and it needs to be followed through in good faith. We have an historic opportunity to complete the largest dam removal project in the history of this nation. And we realize that the FERC decision is not what Pacific Corp may have anticipated. And up to this point, Pacific Corp has worked towards decommissioning. And we encourage this company, we encourage them to expeditiously continue on this righteous path. Not next year or the following, you need to act now. We cannot accept additional delays when the health of our communities and the health of our people and the existence of our communities are at stake. If Pacific Corp opts for additional delays, we must, as a federal and state government, along with local governments and tribal governments, opposed annual licensing and ratepayer increases. That said, we prefer cooperation and unity, but we will need to go to the mat if need be. In an often tense exchange, Representative Huffman told Scott Bolton, Vice President of Pacific Power, that the only obstacle to moving ahead is Pacific Corps' desire to make more money. 
back in 2007 when you were considering relicensing, FERC found that that was going to result in a net operating <laughs> loss of $20 million a year. So that was going to be a, a, a losing business proposition. Removing those dams to achieve the fish objective seems like the only way to go. We've heard from water quality experts that uh, even beyond fish passage, the only way to eliminate the terrible uh, and dangerous conditions that those dams are creating is to take them out. Fish ladder doesn't fix it. No other way to fix it. So yes, improvement uh, of the dam, of the conditions in the river may be inevitable, but it sounds like dam removal is inevitable too. What am I missing? Well, again, I think from Pacific Corp's perspective, uh, the Klamath Hydro Settlement Agreement envisions dam removal as, as an outcome. That's part of the right. deal. Uh, the change condition is that um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has now said that that deal doesn't pass their muster, that um, they fundamentally changed the, the conditions and, frankly, the economic considerations of Pacific Corp and the implications for all of its customers, not just in, in California and Oregon. And so that's frankly what has brought us to the negotiating table. Well, that's I understand. We're I understand down with it's a, to discuss that. Yeah, I, I understand it is a technical change, but um, with this deal, you've got hundreds of millions of dollars from the state of California to help relieve you of this toxic asset that otherwise you're likely to have to remove on your own dime if you go back to re, to, to relicensing. This. FERC order does not require you to walk away from the deal. And I guess what I'm wondering is, how can it possibly be a better business decision for you to say goodbye to those hundreds of millions of dollars from the people of California and to go and have to bear the cost of this on your own anyway, albeit after a certain number of years where you've, you've made the poor folks downstream and these tribes suffer even longer? Why is that a better business decision? Well, what we're examining now, Congressman, is that the the change condition of the FERC order and their preference for Pacific Corp to effectively be the dam removal entity uh, takes on, frankly, costs and liabilities that were not considered as part of the, the original settlement agreement. And so that those costs may, frankly, outweigh the benefits of California money coming towards the KHSA. That's what we're looking at right now, and that's what we're discussing with our settlement partners. As hundreds of Humboldt State University students arrive for the fall semester, often from communities with higher levels of COVID infection, testing at the school has already revealed two new cases. The university on Friday reacted to the unfolding situation by releasing a revised academic calendar. The school will start virtual classes on Monday and limit in-person sessions between early September and early November. According to HSU, the students who tested positive had just recently moved into campus housing. They have been moved to rooms on campus that are set aside for isolation. The university will be providing ongoing support, including frequent health and wellness checks, as well as delivery of meals and other necessities. HSU won't release the names of the students due to privacy concerns, but officials there said this week that they are working closely with public health to chase down others who might have been exposed. Comprehensive testing is continuing for all students living on this campus this year. Campus residents will be tested multiple times during the course of a 14-day quarantine period. This regimen is intended to identify those who may be asymptomatic and isolate them quickly and was implemented late last week with the help of additional resources from the state and county. We'll be right back after this short break. To play every day, like I can do this thing called adulthood. Fighting fire is just hours of hard, boring work punctuated by moments of sheer terror. I want to progress. I want to work hard for a reason. This kid finally realizes that he's alive. Wildland. China's amazing forbidden city. The largest palace complex built at any time in history. An engineering wonder. How did they build it? Made almost entirely of wood. It's a very sophisticated piece of woodworking. And in one of the most earthquake-prone places in the world. Look at how solid it is. How has it survived for more than 600 years? Nova reveals the secrets of the forbidden city.
Humboldt County Health Officer Teresa Frankovich on Wednesday addressed last week's release of emails between herself and HSU President Tom Jackson Jr. She said her concerns over an on-site instruction at HSU were driven by a concern for public health and not racism. The opening of schools, both K-12 and higher education, have been high-charged and ongoing discussions, which are all about timing in a COVID landscape. The reason is that we know gathering people from different households increases risk, and there are challenges in trying to structure the environment to minimize risk. Universities and colleges not only gather students from different households, but also from different counties, most with higher prevalence of COVID than Humboldt because almost all areas of the state have higher level, levels of prevalence. And as we have seen, this movement has been a driver of transmission across the state. It is why we have repeatedly asked residents here to stay close to home and to not bring family and friends here because we have seen the impact locally. Certainly many HSU students are year round Humboldt residents, but on August 7th, I was informed that up to 850 additional students would begin arriving on the 15th for residents in dorms and would arrive over about a week, while an additional unknown number of students we would be arriving to off-campus housing throughout the month. In light of our current epidemiology, I was concerned and expressed that concern to the HSU planning group. Later that day, the state released guidance for higher education and reopening. This affirmed my concerns. It was clear that with our increasing case counts, multiple outbreaks, current testing capacity, and need, as well as contact investigation demands, we did not meet state recommendations regarding on-site instruction. Let me make one thing clear. This is not a case of othering. It is a case of trying to make safe choices for the entire community in the midst of a pandemic. This is about trying to juggle competing needs for testing resources across skilled nursing facilities, agricultural settings, tribal communities, local public schools, businesses and organizations and the community as a whole. State resources have not been able to be utilized to date, so our local laboratory is currently shouldering the entire responsibility on its own. Insinuations of racism and flat out allegations of incompetence have been directed toward me and this incredible health department that I proudly represent simply for stating the facts. That has been disheartening to say the least. I admit the timing and asking for a pause was terrible, as timing often is in a pandemic. There is no doubt about that. But partners talk and try to figure out what might work. They find solutions. That is what we are doing now alongside our HSU partners. I support and celebrate education in all settings. I moved to Humboldt in part because it is a university community, and I love all of what that brings to an area. I welcome the students who are arriving excited about the year to come. All of us at Public Health will do our very best to serve these newest members of our community. Frankovich today revealed that several local agencies are in the process of determining if a regional approach to testing may yield more timely results. The state's contract with OptumServe to provide testing in Humboldt County will expire in September. The Optum site is currently contracted by the state um, through the end of September. So we've been aware of that and we've been planning on whether we wanted to continue using OptumServe and contracting locally or develop another strategy. Because of the concerns we've had about the turnaround time with Optum, I think we were all uniformly looking for another strategy. And so we've been in discussions regionally with Del Norte County, with our tribal partners um, and HSU as well to look at what we could do locally that would give us a really excellent turnaround time and address um, the needs for our community. So uh, we will be having more information about that soon. We're just sort of getting the finals in place on that. This week we feature another local poet who was included in the recently released Behind the Mask anthology. Assembled by Eureka Poet Laureate David Holper and local writer Annie Fricke, the collection features area works on the impacts of COVID and the quarantine. Here's Robert Allen with his poem, Raptured. Hi, my name is Robert Allen, and this poem is called Raptured. The writer came frenzied on a pale horse, and his name was Pestilence. Other writers held for a moment, then flung the deathly themselves back to other violences. This is what it comes to, what fear is, a white horse, a disease, and alone, the way the fury of the long night comes on. We'll be right back after this short break. 
We care about the things that are going to affect the lives of each and every American. What we normally see in these big crises from the United States to Europe to China to Russia. We can go deeper and get nuanced takes on things and allow people to see that everything isn't necessarily black or white. For Sama, for me, it's not a film. It's my life. Sama, Sama. <sighs> it remains a fast moving story climate change, health care, immigration. To peel back the layers of the onion and to get to the heart of what really matters in every issue. We're talking about very big dollars here. It's guaranteed that the numbers of cases in coronavirus will be going up. We're a place that people can come not just to find out what happened, but why it matters. Eureka, Eureka Mayor Pro Tem Kim Bergale delivered the city's weekly COVID message this week, encouraging residents to get out and enjoy the outdoor dining options many local restaurants have made available. She also encouraged folks to use this time to get out of the house and see some of our local natural wonders, such as Sequoia Park and the McKay Tract. Getting outdoors and onto our uncrowded trails for a walk, run, hike, bike, or even kayak, stand-up paddle, or sail is a great way to find some solace in these times. Head up north to our local beaches or down south for more redwoods and some river time. You can't go wrong, and that's what makes us so lucky to live in Humboldt County. So grateful for that. If you had travel plans you had to cancel this summer, take a look in your backyard. Our local restaurants are coming up with innovative ways to continue to offer delicious food and beverages under the current health orders. You'll find parking lots turned into temporary outdoor dining spaces, and other businesses have created permanent outside dining options that will outlast COVID. If you choose to dine out or grab food to go, please be sure to wear a mask and bring along some kindness. We're all working together to adapt and continue to live and work as normally as we can under the circumstances. And when you're able to support a local business, share it out. Spreading the support encourages others to do the same. That's all the time we have for now. Thanks for joining us. For information on local infection numbers, the county's response, and other related information, visit HumboldtGov.org. For relevant conversation, insights, and pivotal analysis, meet us here next week again for 7.30 p.m. for another dose of North Coast Perspectives. Until then, stay tuned and stay informed.